Hi everyone, this is Luke Reiner and I'm here to tell you how easy it is to install Identity Server 3 into your .NET MVC or Webforms applications. Now, the example that I'm going to include here is just going to be the MVC flavor, but I don't have any reason to think that it's going to be any more difficult to use uh, one of the other types of .NET. But if you notice here, the documentation you need is on identityserver.github.io. And in this case, I'm already in this tutorial, which looks pretty long, but it's only because they've broken it down step by step. And in actual fact, I can show you very quickly um, what's supposed to happen. So Identity Server 3 really is a project designed to support OpenID Connect. And if you don't know, what OpenID Connect is, I suggest you jump over to the OpenID website and kind of take a look. But the basic idea is that OAuth 2, which many of us use for single sign-on for our websites, we use things like Facebook and Google logins, they use OAuth 2 and in many cases they are not providing authentication. Because as you've probably noticed, in many cases if you click to log in with Facebook, the Facebook page doesn't ask you anything because probably you're already logged in, in which case it goes straight back to the other site and you're logged in. In other words, pretty much anybody can get into any site using Facebook logging because Facebook does not ask for passwords and stuff. So OpenID Connect is designed to solve part of that problem and it does this by returning a token as well as various other things in the OAuth2 protocol. And the ID token is assigned JSON web token and inside that web token apart from a number of uh, things like hashes and, and signatures and stuff includes an identifier for the user who's authenticating and depending on exactly how you have your OpenID Connect set up it also includes claims about that user such as their name or email address etc. So I'm not going to talk about all the different kinds of flows uh, but just to show you basically how this works, I have two sites running. They're both running in a debugger in Visual Studio 2015. And one of them here is the identity server. So this is the web application that contains information about users and clients. And then I have a client application running, as you can see, on a different port. And this one's running on HTTP. This one's running on HTTPS. Doesn't kind of really matter too much at this stage. But certainly the identity server needs to run HTTPS because that's one of the ways in which the protocol is protected. So what's going to happen here is I want to log in and what I've done is I've protected the about page so that it requires me to log in. So if I click on about it's going to say uh, you need to log in. Now notice here that we've jumped over to the identity server. So in other words we're now here. It's done a redirect and it's come in and it said they're asking you to sign in. Now the tutorial includes the username Bob and the password is secret. Obviously in real life they won't be hard coded. And while you're testing I recommend that you don't tick to remember my login because it just kind of causes confusion sometimes. But I'm going to hit login and it's going to say well now you're logged in I'm going to give you a consent page because the other site that you came from is requesting your permission to show your user profile, your user roles um, and your user identifier which it gets anyway, you can't um, opt out of that one. So you could say I don't want to provide those things but in most cases you go OK. Again I'm going to untick remember my decision just so that I can keep running this if I need to and have it not automatically log me in and I say OK that's fine and notice this, this will go back to the page. This is in the about page and the only reason we've used that is just because it's quick and dirty to um, to replace this one rather than adding another page but obviously that could be any page. And then what I'll show you in a second is we've just taken all of the information that's come back from the identity server in that ID token and it's printed it out here. So uh, in this case it's included things like the names Bob Smith, he's got a couple of roles in there. Uh, that is not his password, that is the type of authentication that was used to authenticate the user. So hopefully you can see here with OpenID Connect you get useful additional information. This site now knows because of this claim that the user was actually authenticated using a password. So it knows they haven't just automatically logged in using Facebook or something else. Um, 
You notice here I've also added a logout button. This isn't in the default web application and that's because I chose to create an empty one as recommended in the tutorial over here. And so I had to add that and I'll show you how to do that in a second. I hit log out. Now part of the OpenID Connect also supports distributed logout. So you notice I've now gone back to the identity server. So my client uh, application has asked the identity server to log out user Bob. So I've gone back here and I said, yep, yeah, you're allowed to log out. Now in normal cases, if I'd set that up properly, that would go back to my client application. But for security reasons, it doesn't do that automatically. And that's to stop people passing in uh, unvalidated redirect URLs, which could be used for phishing and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna change this manually to go back to where I started. Um, I didn't really mean for it to do the distributed logout, but obviously it does that automatically. So here you go. And you notice the logout button is gone because I'm now logged out. And if I click that, the whole thing will happen again. So we're gonna start by looking at the client because that's the kind of the quick and easy one. So I'm just gonna stop these and bring them over. So this is the client application. And as per the tutorial, they recommend that you start with an empty MVC application. And then once you've done that, you, you've got obviously some packages already installed. And then as it says in the tutorial, the client needs to install four NuGet packages. And in the tutorial, two of them are near the top here. So you need the system web OWIN host. So again, that would probably come with an MVC application if you didn't choose the empty one, but because we chose the empty one, we need the OWIN hosting platform. We also need the library itself, Identity Server 3. There is an Identity Server 4, but uh, that's kind of newer and it's slightly different. So we're just gonna talk about Identity Server 3. For the client, if you go down a bit further, you also need these two packages. And these are basically the client versions of OpenID Connect and Cookie Authentication. So they're the four packages that you need to install. You can just install all of those. It'll take a, a few seconds to install, obviously. And then once you've done that, I'm just gonna take you through the different files. Some of these are obviously just for the tutorial. Uh, we've noticed that I've added a logout action, and that's because, like I say, that's not included by default if you choose to make an empty web app. And all that does is call request.getOwinContext.authentication.signout. So that get Owen context, if you haven't used Owen before, uh, you call that quite a lot. And that dynamically binds various uh, elements so you can get access to whatever's been plugged into that Owen pipeline. Uh, after it's logged out, it returns to the index action. So there's kind of not too much about that. That attribute authorized is how we make the about page um, require you to log in. So by default, that isn't there, obviously, because you don't normally log into the about page. Uh, the other thing that we've done here is we've passed the user object. So this is part of uh, .NET that gets populated automatically by identity server. We're passing that to the view so that the view can show all of the claims on the screen as we saw earlier. So they're the only changes to the, the home controller in this case, not very much interesting there. In the about view, we've removed the default about view and kind of basically said, well, our model that was passed to us is an enumerable of claim. And then for each claim in model, we show its type and its value. So again, that's fairly noddy. In real life, you wouldn't really do this. This is just for examples. So that's that. Um, index, nothing interesting I changed on there. The other one added on here is again, just added a logout link. So using this, Nice, neat razor syntax. If user.identity dot is authenticated, then show a logout link on the end. So that's all kind of fairly noddy stuff, fairly easy to do. Nothing really to do with OpenID Connect. They're just things that we've done for the tutorial. All of the interesting stuff, uh, as you can see, there isn't very much of it, is done in the startup class. So with Owen, uh, Owen has to find a startup class and it will look in a number of places. It will look in that default namespace for your assembly. Uh, and if it looks in there and finds a class called startup, that's good. If it can't find it, then you have to specify in web config or using an attribute, uh, which class is your startup class. And then we have this configuration uh, 
method, which gets past the app builder. And this is really just uh, a kind of chain of responsibility pattern where you, you the, the common way to do this is you see these extension methods, which extend iApp builder. And then depending on what you're plugging into your pipeline, in this case, we say use cookie authentication and that will wire up its, its handler to that. Use OpenID Connect authentication. So they were the two packages that we installed. And in this case, authentication type we set to cookies and you might think that's strange, but authentication type can be set to different things because you might have more than one cookie authentication options. Um, so in this case, we just call it cookies. That's fine. That tells it to use normal authentication, not Kerberos or NTLM or any of those horrible things. And then this is really what used to look, look similar but slightly different in the older .NET projects. This is really the wiring that tells this application how to connect to its identity server. So unsurprisingly, we have to point it in this case to remember the identity server was 44300. And the identity, um, identity server library adds this URL automatically and that's the discovery endpoint and if we go there and see what that looks like um, you'll see here identity server 3 so that was added automatically and you kind of got the discovery document is all of the information about the identity server and everything else but again we kind of don't really worry about all of that stuff in there all we know is we point it to the right place and that's all automatically now in this case the client ID is MVC so that's probably a bit misleading in real life you would have a client ID that is probably obtained from the identity server when you register uh, an account. And so that's likely to be a big, big long number or alphanumeric or something like that. So that would be your unique client ID that identifies you. You then have some scopes. So you've got kind of a whole different uh, array of different scopes that you can use. And OpenID Connect specifies some specific ones. Then the redirect URI, where do I come back to when I've successfully logged in. So uh, that's kind, kind of what happens with here. You just pass ourselves. Um, and then in this case, the response type is ID token. And what that means is when I pass in response ID token, it means I'm not going to get a code or anything like you do with OAuth 2. I'm just going to get the authentication token containing all of the information that I've asked for here. And so this is what we call the implicit flow. It just goes in, comes back out very quick um, and has everything we need in there all nice and secure. And in this case, I'm going to say that when it comes back and logs me in, it's going to use the cookies, which is the thing I set up up here. So that's all we have to do configuration. That's the client. You can see it's very, very easy to do. Um, and that there's kind of not really much more to say about that. So now we're just going to take a quick look at the server. And uh, this, if you followed the, oh, just chose the wrong one. If you follow the tutorial, um, this tutorial here, all of this effectively leads you to a system that, that is the identity server and is also a client in the same web app. Now that's kind of okay because in real life, if you've got a site like Google, then probably you can log into Google using Google authentication, even though Google is also the identity server. But it makes the tutorial slightly confusing because as some people have said on forums, you can't really tell where one part ends and another part starts. So hopefully I'm going to be able to explain some of that to you by looking at the identity server. So because this is the server and the client, this also has um, all four NuGet packages installed. So the four that we saw back here, these two at the top, Owen, Host, System Web, and Identity Server 3. And it also has the client ones down here. And uh, there's this issue of um, running all managed modules. And again, that's because of the way that some of the Identity Server things work. So we need to set that in web config. So if we look at here, we've got kind of pretty similar things. We've got the home control, all the rest of it. But really, the interesting stuff for us, again, starts in the startup. And you'll notice there's a bit, a bit more stuff in here. So unfortunately, because this example um, functor is, is, uh, is not synchronous, 
but it, it requires an asynchronous handler. I get this big warning that um, I should just use a normal function, but of course I can't because as you can see, that's um, a sync because it takes a task, which is fantastic. So ignoring the green underlining, we'll see that as we go down here, uh, the first thing we've done is we've mapped that identity. So we saw that earlier and we've passed this a pointer to our identity server. So we've got this app here. This is um, the parameter that gets passed to it. So um, what we do here is we basically give it a site name, we call load certificate. And in the identity server, we use this um, factory pattern and we call uh, um, a function to load up the users, one to load up the clients, one to load up the scopes. Now in real life, these users, so let's start here at users, we go into here. In real life, we're not gonna have in-memory users are hard-coded, hopefully not anyway. Probably they're gonna come from a database, etc. They might be cached in memory, maybe not. But really all this is, is these are your users who are gonna authenticate. So if you were running Facebook, you'd have a list of you know a billion people in here um, with all their relevant information. And something that you'll see a lot is claim because it, a claim is really anything about that person. So I'm claiming that Bob's given name is Bob and his family name is Smith. I'm claiming that he is in that role and I'm claiming he's in that role. So the claims can be anything about, you know, email addresses and, and all kinds of stuff. And you can create custom claims as well if you want. But really, this is just user information, as you probably might expect. And in this case, in the tutorial, we've just created a, a static class to hold that. Clients, likewise, if we go F12 on that and go into here, exactly the same kind of idea. I've created an array. In this case, I have one client. So again, you would normally have this in the database and the database would load all of these clients up or maybe um, you'll wire it up so that when a request comes in, then the system goes to the database to actually find the client. But in this case, we've wired, oh, we've wired it up in a simple way by just using in-memory clients. Uh, you've, got, you've got other options in here, of course, if you hit the dot on the end you can find um, all the other, uh, other sorts of stuff. So you can configure things um, and pl plug in all sorts of stuff. Uh, all the extra help that you need um, is linked at the bottom of the article anyway, if you want to do anything more than that. So that's just wiring up the basic identity server and pointing it to uh, the different stuff. So if you want to look at scopes, so again, we've got a scope. And in this case, we're saying that a scope called roles equates to, um, anything that has a claim of type role. So again, that's a customizable thing. Some of them are, um, are specified automatically like profile and stuff. But in this case, we've invented a, a custom one as well. So that's that. That's the stuff for the clients, um, client login. So we don't really care about that. This is also to do with the client login. But when we um, log in locally, we've done something slightly different. So we've demonstrated that when you actually come back with a security token, once it's validated, then there's also a demonstration again at the bottom of the tutorial, which translates all of the claims that have come back into something that you want. So you can take out claims that you're not interested in. You can transform other ones. Um, you can add new ones in. Uh, in this case, you know, adding a new claim. Uh, because obviously in real life you can do complicated stuff here. You might get back somebody's name and stuff and then you might go back to your database and say, right, what, um, I don't know, what's the handle or the avatar for Bob Smith? And it might come back and you just dump it in the claim so it can be stored in the same place. So there's some claims transformation, but again, that's just kind of the client stuff. Um, and then there's a couple of things here. I uh, can't remember what this was for. The authorization manager let me see if I can find this um, bu, 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 bu. oh sorry this was um, what one of the things that you can also do with it is in terms of actually do you remember in the in the client application which we've also done here if we go to the home controller um, we used authorized we used that to lock down a page but clearly that's not really very fine grained control. So one of the things that you can also do is you can say, well, actually I want to authorize something more specific. So I want to say that in order to access this page, you need the read permission on the contact details object. And if I want to update it, I want the write permission 
on contact details. Now notice here there's no reference to the users or, or roles because what we're trying to do here is decouple those questions. All we're saying here is you're going to need some permission to use this action and in this case the permission is that permission on that object. And what Identity Server gives you for free is the ability to extend their resource authorization manager and that is the uh, the code where that attribute is defined the um, authorized resource and in here you can see that there are check access async and then authorized contact details these are asynchronous why are they asynchronous again because you might be going to a database or something to check these so in this case it's not relevant but by default they're asynchronous methods and in this case it says right what resource am i trying to access well it's the contact details okay call the method that finds out about um, contact details in this case it's going to come in here and say well basically if you're in the geek role you can read something if you're in the operator role you can write it and again you might want to customize all this you might be going off to a database and let the database completely handle um, this functionality so you might do that automatically but that gives us the authorization stuff and we plug it in again using one of these extension methods which is provided by uh, Identity Server. You notice here the certificate as well. Part of the um, part of the problem that we have here is um, is when we provide a signing certificate, people need to know how to use the uh, signing certificate. So we do that. We plumb that in at the bottom by um, by passing in that certificate. Um, you can use a, a self-signed one or anything like that for now, but eventually, obviously, you'd need a, a kind of a proper certificate. And then um, the other two things that we've got is we've you've got this anti-forgery conf, um, configuration parameter, and these two are actually um, parts of .NET. They're not part of the identity server, but um, one of the things here is we're basically going to use the end user. Uh, subject as the um, type identifier for this is the cross-site request forgery token so what you're basically saying is what unique piece of information exists for a user that I can use to seed the cross-site request forgery token and what we're saying is because we use an open ID connect the piece of information that comes back that is unique is the subject and the subject is unique identifier. It could be a number, it could be anything, but because it's guaranteed to be unique, that's what we do there. And what we're saying there is their name might not be unique, so let's use something unique. Um, and then the second one, inbound claim type map, is what happens here is uh, .NET does something. And if, if you remember back on here, we've probably not got it open. When we logged in, we saw a big list of uh, claims and they had really big long um, URL kind of names on them. And that's because the .NET was trying to map them to the, the built-in JSON web token um, types that are used by Microsoft. And in most cases, we're probably not really interested in that. So by setting this to an empty dictionary, then none of those things are gonna map up and we're gonna get the names as they come through, like given name, family name, and stuff like that. So as you can see, even on the um, even on the server, even on the identity server, there's not a lot to do. Um, all of the changes in here, I think, apart from that one, which I had to point it to the right startup class, um, I think all the rest of these things were basically added automatically by the different packages that we were, in, we were installing. So that's all we really did and that's what ended up with our identity server. Um, and really it's as easy as that. There, there are lots of other things that you can set. So once you know a bit more about um, OAuth 2 and particularly OpenID Connect, you can then start looking at what sort of flows you want to use. Um, again, they're all for different reasons, for different uses. And you might find when you change these that your login from the client starts breaking. And that's just because, um, for instance, in the client, um, where were we? Just find my startup. You notice here that the response type is ID token. 
by definition, that response type re uh, relates to the implicit flow. So if I change the flow that's allowed for that client, then that's not going to work because that only relates to the implicit flow. If I did, you know, code and ID token, then that becomes a hybrid flow. So I could do hybrid flow and then that would work. So there's kind of obviously lots of extra stuff in there, uh, setting up U URLs and again, um, another load of um, settings that you can add in. So whatever it is that you want to do, you can do really in here. Um, and it's fantastic because all this is built in. So it's very easy to get the basic stuff up and running. It's pretty secure by default, which is also good. So you don't have to do lots of locking down. But at the same time, if you do want that extra functionality, those extra flows, the extra information, if you need to do the transformation of the data that comes back, all of those kinds of things, it's all doable, but it will also work if you don't do any of those things. So hopefully that should show you very easily how to set that up. Identity Server 3, as I said before, you can find it at identityserver.github.io and all the kind of stuff there. Identity Server is the one you want. And all kinds of stuff in there, including documentation and everything else. Um, and hopefully you'll get on really well with it. I will do another couple of videos about OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect more specifically, which won't uh, include the, the actual coding. It will just include the, the theory. But if you already know the theory, you just want to get it working, hopefully this video has shown you how quick and easy that is. If you do have a problem, almost certainly you've got that which doesn't match up with, um, not with that, yeah, with this. So again, check that your client IDs match. One of the things you've got to watch out for, this redirect URI is matched exactly, except it's case insensitive. So if one has a slash on the end and the other doesn't, they won't match and you will get a, a failure to log in. So HTTP has to match. If it's HTTPS, that has to match on both ends. So look out for that, look out for that. Um, if the client is not enabled, so in the clients list here, if that is set to false, you'll also it will also fail. If the flows don't match the response type, then that will fail as well. Um, other than that, you should get a more meaningful message if it doesn't work. And good luck with your plumbing.